Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Operational Data in the Cloud, Amazing Ways to Use It and Easy Ways to Get It There. Now, thanks for joining us today. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Travis Cox. I am the co-director of sales engineering here for, at Inductive Automation. I'm presenting and moderating today's webinar, and I'll introduce my guest panelists in just a moment. Here's the agenda for the next hour. I'm going to introduce our company and our software product, Ignition. I'll introduce the panelists. We'll then discuss how the cloud can fit in with your operations. Then we'll talk about some ways that you can use your operational data in the cloud, some different ways to get that data up into the cloud, and then we'll go over some of the big benefits of the specific solutions that our company offers. At the end, there'll be a Q&A. So first, give you a little background on our company. Inductive Automation has been in business since 2003. Since then, we're pleased to say that industrial organizations in over 100 countries have chosen our Ignition software for their HMI, SCADA, MES, and IIoT needs. We have over 1,600 integrators that have joined our integrator program, and our software is utilized by um, and trusted by many companies, of which we have 48% of Fortune 100 and 28% of Fortune 500 companies. You can find a lot more about that at our website at inductiveautomation.com forward slash about us. As you can see here, Ignition is, is trusted and used um, by many great companies and organizations in virtually every industry, oil and gas, water and wastewater, food and beverage, government, transportation, packaging, and many others. Our signature product is Ignition by Inductive Automation, which is the world's first truly in universal industrial application platform that provides you with integrated development environment for SCADA, MES, and IIoT. It has an unlimited licensing model that gives you unlimited tags, screens, clients, projects, device connections, and more. It is cross-platform, so it run, runs any flavor of Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, both on the server and on the client side. It is based on IT standard technologies, and uh, we've blended the world of OT and IT together but it's important that we keep things standard, standards-based and not do anything proprietary. We have a very scalable server-client architecture that is uh, web-based and web-managed. The clients and the designer is web-launched. So you can launch anywhere in your organization without having to install any software. It has a uh, modular platform so that you can pick and choose the modules, uh, much like you can add apps to your phone uh, for the functions that you require. And it has a rapid development and deployment, uh, you know, very rapid development deployment tool. So today, my panelist is Arlen Nipper. He is the chief technology officer and founder of Sirius Link Solutions, which is an inductive automation strategic third-party uh, module partner. Arlen has over 37 years of experience in the skate industry. His experience covers a broad range of technology from the design and manufacture of embedded computer systems to complete SCADA system infrastructure. And infrastructure implementation for numerous Fortune 100 oil and gas companies. He's also the co-inventor of MQTT protocol in conjunction with IBM, and he's involved in many of the activities that have led to the MQTT becoming a dominant force for IIoT. Arlen, before we begin, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company? Uh, thank you, Travis. Appreciate that. Uh, so basically, SiriusLink was started uh, about five years ago, and since we, myself, and all the developers and executives at SiriusLink all had 20 years of experience in, in using MQTT, I guess you could say we're in the MQTT enablement business. Of course, you know, finding inductive automation and, and being introduced to the Ignition product has let us leverage that heavily in how we can leverage MQTT protocol going forward. So I'm looking forward to this, uh, the rest of this webinar, and uh, let's get going. All right. Well, thank you, Arlen. So first, we're going we're gonna to start by um, you know, looking at how the cloud fits in with your operations. So by now, most people who work for industrial organizations have known about the cloud for a decade or more. They know that the cloud is basically a term for a wide range of services and resources, such as applications, networking, and storage via the internet. But there's still some confusion about how to use the cloud most effectively. A lot of people are still wondering, how can I leverage the cloud effectively across my entire enterprise? How should we put data into the cloud? And what exactly should we do with our data once it's in the cloud? In today's webinar, I hope we can clear up some of the confusion about all of that. 
and give you a course uh, for how you can move forward with using the cloud effectively. Before going further, it's a good idea to cover, um, to go over the general pros and cons of cloud computing. So if you look here on the pros, uh, cloud computing gives you easy data access from anywhere on multiple devices. It requires less uh, computing power. It's easy to scale as we can add more instances, more machines, more data, uh, more storage um, easily. But we're paying per use. Um, so it, that, that really does save an IT cost. It, it takes the, the burden of having physical hardware and having to worry about that on premise and allows you to, uh, to, to use as much as you as you can or as much as you need in the cloud. Of course, there are some cons. A lot of people are very uh, concerned about security. Um, there's, access, there's access to it from the internet. Uh, it's a target for hackers. Governments can access data without search warrants. Um, and there's performance concerns in regards to bandwidth. Uh, you know, it is dependent on internet connections. There's latency we have to think about. And of course, reliability uh, in that, not of the reliability of the cloud, those infrastructures are quite good, have really good uptime, but reliability of the connections to the cloud. Um, so failure is there. What happens on premise? Um, do we lose data? Do we lose control? Those kinds of things. So these are things that we should be aware of. Um, and we're, and what we, when we're thinking about where to use the cloud in our organization and how we're going to approach that. So given that pro, those pros and cons, I think the most effective use of the cloud across the enterprise is to do more with your operational data. Specifically, that means sending operational tags or data into the cloud. So values from PLCs and databases or from devices, values from OPC servers, um, you know, in-memory information, set points, values from different databases, from uh, expressions, and many others you may have internally. Today, we'll show you how to get tags from Ignition into cloud services in a simple, secure, and efficient manner. As we'll show, the solution can help your company to utilize big data, analytics, machine learning, and more, have a single source of truth for your tag data, getting context, um, getting your, your data with context, using cloud and edge computing together, bridging the gap between operational technology and information technology, and other great benefits, as we'll point out. Now, we're really talking about putting data into the cloud and using that, that operational data. We're not talking about hosting SCADA in the cloud. Um, and with, when you're hosting SCADA in the cloud, it's a completely different set of things we have to think about, especially because there's control. Um, and today, we want to focus more on being able to, to take that, that read-only data and to do more with that data uh, once we have it. So with that being said, now let's talk about some of the cloud services that are available. Uh, where we can send our data and leverage it. We're going to focus on the two biggest cloud providers, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. Let's first start with Amazon AWS. Um, there are three major services that companies uh, want to take advantage of in AWS. And these services are Kinesis Streams, DynamoDB, and S3 Data Lake. We'll talk a little bit about more uh, each of those and then how we get data into those. So the first one here to look at is the Kinesis Streams. Um, the, these streams collect, process, and analyze real-time streaming data, such as video, audio, logs, uh, website click streams, IoT telemetry data, you know, SCADA information, um, any data we want to send up there. They allow you to process and analyze data as it arrives, instead of having to wait until all the data is collected before processing can begin. So a potential use of Kinesis Streams would be to send real-time tag data from SCADA to the streams to utilize, to utilize that in a variety of ways within Amazon's web services. The second is DynamoDB. And this is a type of NoSQL or non-relational database um, versus a SQL database that is relational. It utilizes a variety of data models, including document, model, uh, graph, key value, and others. It is uh, very easy to, uh, to develop and to get going with. It's very scalable. Uh, both in size and performance, uh, it has high availability um, in that there's a lot of uptime and um, with, with being able to utilize it. And so, some people consider NoSQL to be better suited to cloud-based computing, especially when it comes to analytics. So a potential use case here of DynamoDB is to scale your, your, your data horizontally, um, getting data from multiple machines without interrupting your service, 
so we can then take that data and, and turn it into some information. And that's tough to do with SQL on premise, especially when we're trying to scale it as more data and uh, devices come into the mix. The third here is S3 uh, Data Lake, and um, S3 stands for a simple storage service. Data Lake is a term for a flat, unstructured, centralized repository for securely storing, categorizing, and analyzing data. So advantages of a data lake is it's more agile and flexible than traditional data storage and analytic tools, lets you collect and store any type of data, and it's uh, extremely low in cost. And so again, uh, collecting that real-time data in the data lake and then being able to retrieve that whenever we want and to, of course, to take advantage of that with some other tools. So what I'd like to do here is kind of hand it over to Arlen. Arlen has had a lot of, a lot of familiarity with these cloud uh uh, services, in particular AWS and Azure, and uh, I'm going to let him go through a diagram of, of how we can get data into AWS through these different these three different services we talked about, then of course what we can do with it once it's there. So Arlen, you want to take over here? Okay, thanks Travis. So this is kind of an architectural uh, diagram, if you will, of all of the services that are available in Amazon Web Services. So you can see on, on the left side, You've got your, your uh, traditional uh, data stream as well as this, this thing called Amazon Kinesis. Or, and there's Kinesis Streams and there's Kinesis Firehose. Now, the, the advantage of using Kinesis here is that both all of the cloud service providers, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Google Cloud Platform, and others, are really kind of pushing this notion of a serverless infrastructure. And by that, what I mean is that we can take Kinesis streams and this, these functions or event-driven uh, uh, code snippets called lambdas. And by using AWS lambdas, we can basically take any data coming off of our Kinesis streams and push that to any of the other Amazon services. So you can see here that you could flow into an S3 data lake. And then from the S3 data lake, once you had your real-time tags, let's say from Ignition in a data lake, then you could go off and start machine analytics, adapt, uh, machine learning, predictive analytics. And then you could go from, say, the, the most recent week or month's worth of data from a you know, S3 data lake, you could move that off to, say, Glacier Storage where the, the cost of storage is much, much lower than that. And then, of course, the other advantage that you've got with all the cloud service providers is they have a huge um, uh, partner program where you may not be the expert in machine learning or, or data visualization or analytics, but by leveraging some of the service partners that are already working with Amazon, hopefully we'll show you a way to get your tag data, your operational data into Amazon, and then leverage all of those tools and capabilities that are available. All right. Well, thank you, Arlen. So I think next here is let's take a look at Microsoft Azure, the other big service. So I want to really introduce these two, get you thinking about them. Then we're going to talk in more detail uh, with how these work. Um, so here with, with Azure, there are two main services that a lot of companies are taking advantage of, and that is Power BI and machine learning. So Power BI, uh, let's talk about that one first is a suite of business intelligence tools uh, that is up there. So business intelligence is basically about acquiring raw data and turning it into information that is useful for business analysis. The tools in Power BI can be used throughout your organization to create personalized dashboards, uh, create and publish reports on the web and mobile devices, have real-time visibility of your supply chain, and do ad hoc analysis. Azure also has a machine learning service. Uh, machine learning refers to the study of pattern recognition and computational learning theory in artificial intelligence. In other words, enabling machines to learn from data and experiences, emulating the way that humans learn so that we can take action without explicit programming. This is a broad field. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but there are applications that are the, but the applications that are most relevant to in the industrial world are predictive maintenance, Control, uh, quality control, demand forecasting, uh, raw material price forecasting, predicting machine settings, training industrial robots, and a lot more. So, of course, 
One of the biggest use cases here is to use machine learning to operate machines more efficiently and to be notified of failures before they occur um, so that we don't have to have, as an example, a lot of inventory of uh, replacement parts where we can uh, more or less you know, be notified when things are about to happen. And also, of course, to, to run things uh, more efficiently you know, according to those models. So Arlen, I know um, that you, again, have a lot of experience with, with this, uh, these tools as well. And uh, maybe you want to describe Azure's architecture here. And then I think you have a couple of use cases to share. Yes, thanks, Travis. So uh, again, you know, kind of a topology draw, drawing of um, Microsoft Azure and the services that you've got. So we will be looking at the ingest coming from Ignition, coming in through IoT Hub, and then going to the services that you mentioned, Power BI, storage, machine learning, uh, and again, some of the partner programs that, that work with those tools to be able to leverage that. So kind of the, the two use cases that we've got in, in customers that are using our Azure injector modules in conjunction with Ignition is one is a global manufacturing company and they're basically leveraging machine learning. They're publishing vision data containing the dimensions of finished products directly to Azure IoT Hub and those are that's going then into the data lake storage. Concurrently, they're sending process data and MES data to IoT Hub for uh, data lake. Now, they're using that for both predictive analytics, i.e. their maintenance department, and predictive downtime. So using that with their MES scheduling and predicting their, their OEE, they're able to get a more granular machine and cell state um, um, on, on their production line. So they have algorithms that they've implemented that look at all the data in the lake and split out the analysis on expected downtime for upcoming run versus actual. And help, this helps them predict a more accurate scheduling of production runs uh, and more accurate scheduling times. So that's a global manufacturing company. Uh, the use case number two is an oil and gas company. And in that, upper management asks for new technology to better enable innovation across the company. Uh, their, their technical people researched the options, determined that they could use cloud technology to enable the following. So number one, more uh, data storage capability, including no SQL options. So this gave them longer term data retention without having to scale out on site in, in their own hardware and software locally. Second one is to provide more data accessibility and, visual, and visualization for the operational data at all of the remote locations. The next one was a more event-driven data environment that doesn't re rely on task scheduling to move data from the SCADA system to upper level business systems that were gonna leverage that data. Machine learning models that are applied against assets, including image recognition. And what we're finding out is that companies like uh, Limitor with their motor operated valves, uh, Westinghouse with their electric motors, are starting to provide services that if we can get our operational data up into the cloud, those services that they offer will be able to look at that information. And since they're the manufacturer of the equipment, can give us a much better view of you know, the, predict the predictivity, if you will, of when that equipment might fail going forward. So those are just a few of the many use cases that we're seeing as customers come to us, they, they, they say, hey, we've got all this data, we don't know exactly what we wanna do with it, but we at least wanna start getting it up into the cloud and seeing what our options are. All right, thank you, Arlen. Yeah, I think that last point is, is really important here in that um, you know we're, we're, we may not have the, the, the actual insight as to what we want to do when, with that data in the cloud, but getting it up there is certainly the first battle. Um, and then having it in, with, to be able to utilize these services to be able to do more, um, there, there's a lot of uh, examples and things that are, that, that are really powerful. So I, you know, a lot of you might be thinking at this point, wow, it does look like we can do a lot of awesome things with, they, with the data in the cloud when it comes to like machine learning and business intelligence and all of that. But what's the best way to get data up into the cloud? 
how do we get it there? Um, so let's talk about that, and um, in particular, we're going to talk about how we can do that with Ignition. So one of the first steps, though, before, um, I mean, we can certainly take data from Ignition and, and get it right directly up to the cloud, but we have problems we want to solve. There's a problem of being able to um, fundamentally decouple devices from applications locally, on-premise, so that we can scale up and have more devices that we can add into infrastructure. And then there's the ability, of course, to get all that data to a cloud infrastructure. We're going to talk about both. Now, you don't have to do, you don't have to do both in, in sequence here. We can certainly start taking advantage of, of pushing data to the cloud. But I think it's, it, we can't ignore um, our operations that we have on premise as well. And then we need to, to, to take a look at both pieces of this. So I think the first step really is to, um, on premise, decouple devices from applications. And when we do that, that allows us to get all of that data from all our devices into a single place. And it's, it's, a, it's a really a, a fundamental concept for IIoT and the ITOT convergence. So instead of using pull response protocols, we should move to a published subscribe architecture that makes all of our data accessible using message-oriented middleware. So we like to, to say, let's stop connecting SCADA directly to devices. And in other words, let's connect devices to infrastructure so that we can have many consumers of that data and SCADA would be one of those consumers. But we can actually bring the data into other systems like you know, maintenance management or ERP or other tools that are, that are there uh, locally. So really this, this, this decoupling is a very important step. Now we're certainly in the world of brownfield um, and there is some investment to be able to take legacy pull response protocols and to convert it to a, a protocol like MQTT, which we'll talk more about here today. So I think that's really an important first step is to decouple devices from applications, or at least a step that you should be thinking about as you move forward, especially when we're wanting to leverage cloud infrastructures. So specifically, we're talking about MQTT. I, I mentioned that, um, but MQTT is a pub sub protocol and it has become the go-to or the de facto standard for IoT solutions for a lot of different reasons. It's extremely lightweight um, and uh, it's very, very low bandwidth, uh, very important for remote um, you know, architectures, but certainly on-premise that allows us to transfer more data through our network more efficiently. It has bidirectional data flow, and uh, so we can read and write, but it uses message-oriented middleware architectures. Uh, it has stateful awareness, which is really important for SCADA. We need to know the state of the connection as well as if we can trust the values we have on screen, and it reports by exception. So we have devices that are at the edge of the network. We can put a, an edge gateway next to these devices to translate pull response protocols to MQTT. We publish the data up by exception, and then applications like Ignition or other SCADA systems can subscribe to that data to get that information in. So a diff definitely a different architecture than having SCADA talk directly to those devices. But by decoupling it, we have benefits, um, a lot of different benefits that allow us to try out new technologies, to upgrade infrastructures, to add, introduce new things, make it plug and play. And it really um, gives us a, a much better architecture than we've had with these pull response protocols. So um, without further ado, I think we should turn it over to Arlen. Arlen is the co-inventor of MQTT, and he has, uh, his company has made modules for Ignition that allow it to work with, uh, with this protocol, as well as modules that get data up to the cloud. So I think at this point, let's, let's turn over to Arlen so we can talk about the modules in more detail and then um, get into how we can actually leverage these to uh, especially leverage the cloud. Arlen? Okay. Thanks, Travis. So... I guess the first thing we'll talk about is the three modules that SiriusLink developed uh, to basically MQTT enable uh, Ignition. So the first module was MQTT Distributor. And what we realized is that Distributor is nothing more than a very uh, lightweight MQTT server that runs as a module on Ignition. It, it really doesn't do anything else. It just gives us the ability to have an MQTT server to get started with. Now, MQTT Engine adds the functionality of being able to be an MQTT client on Ignition and go out and connect to an MQTT infrastructure. Now, with that capability, now we can learn all of the devices that are publishing information in. 
We can learn the metrics of those devices, the characteristics, their configuration, and most importantly, we can learn about all the tags those devices out in the field are publishing. And then what we found out, you know, after working with, with inductive automation and ignition is that literally there were thousands of ignition gateways that for all practical purposes were already sitting on the edge of the network. So the OPCUA polling was working fine at those remote locations, but then they wanted to take those tags that were available, the, the OPCUA tags, the memory tags, the calculation tags, and be able to take those tags and publish those back out to an MQTT infrastructure. So with these three modules, that's basically the IIoT components, if you will, of an ignition gateway system. Now, once we had that data, what we were starting to get asked for, again, it's about the last 12 to, to 18 months, is that, okay, now we're starting to access more information. Um, one of the statements that, that I had made previously is that, you know, looking at all the devices that we have in the field um, and looking at all that information that each of those devices had, whether they were PLCs or smart transmitters or flow computers or industrial control systems, we were leaving probably, you know, 70, 80 percent of that data stranded in the field. Um, more recently, I attended the uh, AWS reInvent conference and you know they're saying we're leaving 99% stranded but regardless if we can start using MQTT like technologies to bring that stranded data in well now we want to take those tags once we have them in ignition and be able to get those out to cloud services so the two new modules that we introduced were the AWS injector and the Azure injector and they use the same efficiency that we use for the edge of network running on ignition edge uh, in publishing data on, on exception. We use that same efficient reporting scheme to be able to push real-time tag information and all of the properties up into cloud services. Now, the first one we'll go through here is the AWS injector module. And you can see here that once we have our operational data in an ignition gateway or an ignition edge, we can use the AWS injector to go straight into a Kinesis stream. Now, as I explained a while ago, once we've got it in a, in a Kinesis stream, that is basically a durable, uh, up to hundreds of millions of messages per second, 24 hour durable stream. Now, what we can do then is use Lambda functions and some of the Kinesis analytics to take those tag, the tag information once it's flowing into Kinesis and then route that data to any or all of the services that are available within Amazon Web Services. Now, the next thing is looking at the same aspect of that. So we have Ignition Gateway running or we have Ignition Edge running. We want to take operational data there and we want to get it into Microsoft Azure. So there, those adapters connect into Azure IoT Hub and using the same thing. And so here, instead of it being lambdas like it was on AWS, it's called uh, functions. And so basically, again, every time an event uh, notes that a new message has been delivered into Azure IoT Hub, we can take that event, process it, and then take it to any of the services that are in Azure. And now we were looking at the gateway examples. So even if I've got an edge device, so if I'm running Ignition Edge, which is the software product that inductive automation has that will let you run basically a small version of Ignition all the way out on an embedded microprocessor out in the field, now we can add the Azure or an and or injector modules out there to go straight from our edge all the way up into the cloud services. So let's start looking at some of the architectures that we can put together. And so like, like Travis was saying, and then along with the ecosystem that we started to put together that have basically implemented MQTT now. So if I look at this population of BNB SmartWorks, Easy Automation, Alexis, Android Applications, Hilsher, Ignition Edge, uh, the Magnetrol, Blue Tech Box, Moxa, Nexoforge, Node Red running on any of those platforms, Opto 22, or even Ignition itself. 
And we're taking and connecting information from these devices on the left side of the slide here, and literally just publishing that into infrastructure. But now that we have that information into infrastructure, we can take Ignition Gateway, subscribe to all that information, and use that effectively as our SCADA system. Now, then from there, we can take any of those tags that we want, either a subsection or, or all of them, and publish them up to Azure IoT Hub and or Kinesis at the same time. This also lets us take the, a view of the world of, you know, if we, we, if we get, you know, less granular, that is that Ignition becomes that tool that I can, it becomes an IIoT tool, becomes a SCADA tool, becomes an MES tool. And that is first and foremost in that now that I can show a customer that you've got a better, faster, more scalable, more reliable SCADA system. And now we can take those tags and provide that as a tool, if you will, to go into Azure IoT Hub or into Kinesis as well. We can also use Ignition as a migration strategy. So a lot of the projects that we're doing now is that we're using a subset of Ignition's capabilities, i.e. the OPC UA module, and we can take the OPC UA client and go to existing SCADA HMI systems, scan for the OPC UA tags, bring those in. And one of the things that we can do here, as, as Travis was explaining before, is that now that we've got those tags in Ignition, we can start adding context to those tags. So what I got from OPC UA may have been a value of, you know, a Modbus register 40,012. And I know it's a value between zero and 4095. And I could publish that up to Azure or Kinesis. But when the IT guys look at that, they're going, well, wait a minute, we need some more context if we're going to run analytics on this day. We can't just say, oh, that's 40,012 and it's, it's a nebulous number between zero and 4095. So what we can do in Ignition is starting to add the context that Travis was talking about a while ago. So we can take that tag and using the editor in, in Ignition, we can say, well, that tag is actually suction pressure. Uh, we can take that unscaled analog value and say, well, it's 0 to 4095 is now representative of 0 to 250. And that 200, 0 to 250, actually, let's put in engineering units. So now when that tag gets up into our cloud applications, we know now that it's suction pressure. We know that it's a 0 to 250 PSI value. And now we can run more intelligent analytics on that information. So the important point here is that Ignition, you know, a lot of people think of it as just a SCADA system or just an MES system, when actually it's a very cost-effective tool for any sort of IAOT migration strategies that you might want to put together. Now, my, my point here, in, when I do a lot of these presentations, is that, you know, everybody's running around talking about big data and all these cloud analytics and machine learning and all this cool stuff we can do on your operational data. But the point is, is that, you know, I tried this for 15 years with IBM from more of a IT down to OT approach, and that never works. My point here is that, we've got to show operational people within any organization that the SCADA system, the operational system, the control system, the factory control system is a better, faster, more scalable, more available SCADA system than using legacy technologies. But if we can't do that at, at purely an operational level, my point is that we'll never get the big data. So unless you can show a manager that he's got a better SCADA system and start providing this decoupled architecture, then we'll never get to that stranded data that it takes for us to get information up in the cloud to take advantage of all of the promise, quote, of what the Internet of Things is going to provide to us. So in kind of in a, an overall summary, if you, if you take a look from, you know, the right side of the slide to the left slide side is that 
the first thing that we can do is we can get all of this operational information and decouple it by using this ecosystem of edge of network or native devices that have implemented MQTT. They can all be securely connected using TLS. And note in this point is that these are all remote originated connections. So there's no ports open in the field if you're looking at this from a cybersecurity standpoint. And first and foremost, there's no one application sitting in the center. There's not a SCADA system in the center. There's not an OPC UA server in the center. There's just infrastructure that can be very, very redundant. Also notice that this entire infrastructure can be managed by controlling access to a single port, port 8883 in your infrastructure. So it becomes very easy to manage from a cybersecurity standpoint. Now, note at this point, we can plug in Ignition and we have a SCADA system. Looking at the ecosystem, we could plug in Seek for data analytics, or we could plug in another Ignition gateway using its OPC UA client to pull information from a legacy SCADA system. We could add another Ignition instance if we wanted to and use the AWS and Azure injector modules to get some of those tags pushed out to cloud services. Then we can have companies like OSIsoft have implemented MQTT, so it could just plug in as a native client and discover tags just like Ignition does. And then we look at best-in-class applications like control room management systems, leak detection, and MES, OEE, and track and trace solutions. So if you look at the overall architecture, really what we're saying is by decoupling devices and by using best-in-class applications, we can be very serendipitous with how we put together solutions. Now, what we're gonna do is jump into a demo. Um, I'm gonna show you both uh, Azure as well as AWS. Now, for AWS, we actually put together a demo that the architects helped us do um, at the AWS reInvent conference. And so I've got a, a pretty uh, uh, indicative flow here of going in through Kinesis Streams to analytics into an S3 uh, data lake, and then from there using Redshift and be able to just do some quick uh, visualization, if you will. Now, this isn't going to be an all-inclusive demo. Um, as you can imagine, each one of these could be a, a, an hour webinar in and of itself, but hopefully we'll give you a good flavor of what you can do with uh, Ignition and cloud services. So, Travis, if you want to make me presenter, so what I've got up here is I've got an uh, a, uh, Ignition Gateway running. As you can tell, um, it's standard gateway. And what we're going to look at here is we're using MQTT to bring in tags from a simulation that we're running off of a real Ignition Edge. So if we go over to the Ignition Edge, this is where we've got a, a pump UDT, we've got a valve UDT, and we're basically running a pipeline simulation here. So I can go into my ignition gateway and I can do a sequence stop. And you can see that that will cause the suction and discharge valves to go closed. My pump will turn off and my flow rates will go to zero. Now my bearing temperatures on the pump, you know, those, are, those will start coming down. And now I can do a sequence start. And that whole process of, of a sequence with the suction valve opening, then the pump starting, and then the discharge valve opening, and then we start getting flow rates. So let's say I wanted to take some of these tags into a cloud application. So what I'm gonna do now is open the console for my Ignition Gateway. Let's take a look at the modules. And of you that are familiar with Ignition, these are all the standard modules, but let's go down here. And these are the third party modules that Cirrus Link has developed that we've got installed. And we've got a AWS injector and Azure injector installed. And so if I go over here, I can see that I can set up my Azure settings. And from here, I can go to Azure IoT Hub. And basically, I put in the um, permissions and all of the, the um, parameters that I need to connect to Azure IoT Hub. The same for AWS Injector. So we'll go to the AWS settings. And again, we've got a Kinesis Stream set up. And if I go into Kinesis, we can look at the configuration here, and with the Kinesis, we have the properties that we need to be able to connect to uh, your Kinesis stream that you've got running up in the cloud. 
So next thing we'll look at is let's look at the Azure dashboard. And again, this is my device that I've got configured. So my ignition gateway is looking like a very large IoT device to Microsoft Azure. And then as I was telling you a while ago, we're basically running in a serverless architecture in that we have a C-sharp function that gets called every time a new message or a new tag hits my uh, Azure infrastructure. So as soon as this opens up, I can look at my event hub trigger. And this is basically just a small bit of C-sharp code that gets run every time I get a new tag update in Ignition. And so by looking at this, I can open my logs and I can grab a message that just got published from Ignition and copy it and basically go over here and let's paste that JSON message that we just published and clean it up just a little bit. And we can see here that for that booster station simulation, I can tell you that this tag or group of tags came from this group, this location, this booster station. I can tell you that this is a discharge pressure. I can tell you what its engineering units are. I can tell you its timestamp of when it was actually uh, gathered in the field. And all of that information is available to any service that you want to route that to within Microsoft Azure. So now let's take kind of the same look at that within um, Amazon. So as we said, with Amazon, what we've got is we've got a Kinesis stream set up. And we call that test stream. If we go back to our configuration um, in AWS Injector, uh, that is a, the, our test stream. And these are the access keys that we're able to do there. And I just want to note here that if I set this session token, I can actually share this stream with another company. So let's say Limitork or Westinghouse or a uh, machine manufacturer wanted you to route some of your operational data to their services, then that's where you would set this up. Let's go back to Kinesis. Now, once we've got that, we basically are throwing in that diagram that I showed you, we're putting that into an S3 data lake and we're putting it into um, Redshift for visualization later. So from here, we can go into our data analytics, look at the Kinesis demo that we have running, look at the application details. And we can see here that from this Kinesis test string, we're basically using Firehose to take that and create a raw stream into an S3 data lake and a filter stream that will be routing to Amazon's uh, Redshift service. So by looking at that, we can go back to uh, Amazon services, go into S3. And from S3 in our Kinesis demo, we see that for the raw data that's flowing in, for the month of December, for the, the 13th, we've got these uh, basically data lakes, these buckets of S3 uh, records that we can go in here and we can go in. And if we open this, we can see again that we have all of that tag information that's coming from that booster station is being published in real time in JSON. Now, Realizing that JSON is kind of a native tool for any of the other services within Amazon, we can use that. In our Lambda function. To be able to go process records and what we're going to do is you can see here we've got Kinesis connected. It's going into process a record It's basically throwing this in the cloud watch. So now I can open a CloudWatch view, and in CloudWatch, we have these records coming in in real time. We'll look at our logs. And again, we can go into the most recent one. Oops. Go into our process Kinesis records, open the CloudWatch, and come in here. And then from here, again, we see all of the real time tags with all of their context. 
what that tag name is, what its timestamp is, what its value is, where it's originated from within my overall SCADA system. And we can look at it right here in a console. So the last thing that we did was we, we threw that over into uh, Redshift. And then from Redshift, we can go in through CloudWatch. And what I've pulled out here is the bearing temperature of, of what I'm republishing. And so I can see here that, you know, I was running a pipeline. I shut it down. My bearing temperatures went down. I started the pump back up. Slowly, the bearing temperatures start going back up until we're at a quiescent value. And then, again, we shut down the pump and our bearing temperatures start going down again. So, again, I know this is a very kind of simplistic example. And I would look to the audience that's participating here to give us, you know, a lot of different ideas on what you would want to see next as we start giving you the ability then to take data and all the tags and all the context out of ignition and then throw that up to cloud services in whatever form you want to consume it in once you get it up there. So with that, Travis, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Arlen. Um, and uh, so let's let's wrap up here, talk about some of the benefits before uh, we go into the Q&A. And uh, there are a lot of benefits with uh, these solutions for organization. Uh, for starters, they provide a single source of truth for your tag information. This is the decoupling of your architecture, um, you know, having devices published infrastructure. The device itself will become the single source of truth of the data. Um, and it's delivered to all the applications. And that means that if the tag values change or any information about the tag values change, uh, that will be reflected in every system you have. Uh, because of that de decoupled architecture, there's no need to remap or translate any of this data um, you know, to the different destinations. So everyone in the enterprise can use the same data and allows us to play around with new kinds of data as well and, and, and look at new development. And this can save you really thousands of hours of labor. Another great benefit is that you're getting data with context um, without using asset frameworks, uh, as these can be very expensive. At Brownfield, Brownfield facilities, asset management frameworks are often used to add context to the data before it's, it's put into the cloud. Using Ignition Edge or MQTT transmission at the edge of the network, we can get data to the cloud with that context without having to have these, these different additional uh, asset frameworks. Another benefit of these solutions is they bring cloud computing and edge computing together for the benefit of the enterprise. So edge computing has been getting a lot of attention lately and some analysts are predicting that the edge will make the cloud less relevant and, and we think that's crazy. In our view, edge computing is an essential part of getting data and information across the enterprise, especially into the cloud. The edge is usually best for getting data quickly, immediate reaction and local control and storage. The cloud is usually best for long-term collection and big picture perspective on your data. With both of these solutions, you get the best of these of both worlds. One last uh, benefit is that these solutions really help bridge the gap between OT and IT. OT and IT departments don't often communicate with each other very much, as a lot of you probably know, and these solutions help you uh, to make them work as a more united team. IT understands cloud infrastructures. They understand uh, these different frameworks like AWS and Azure's uh, services. And OT, of course, can, provide secure, uh, can, can securely provide information to IT now uh, while maintaining the system. So as long as we know use standard um, protocols and technologies, it, it allows the two to work together, and especially when we can deliver it into the, to the enterprise without affecting our SCADA and our operations that we have. So that way the business can start doing a lot more with that data. Really the goal with Ignition is to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, and we want to provide the most secure, simple, effective, and affordable um, bridge between the two. And there's a lot of different ways that Ignition can be used from the edge of the network all the way to the enterprise and delivering data to the cloud. And we wanted to kind of, you know, give you a sense of that, how you can leverage Ignition and the tools that are there and what's out there in the cloud to, uh, to ultimately do a lot more with the data you guys have. With that... Before I go to the Q&A, certainly I'd encourage all of you to go and download Ignition and play around with it if you haven't done so already. You can try it out for free at uh, and by downloading it from our website, DuxPodMation.com. It installs in less than three minutes, and you can use the trial as long as you'd like. You simply have to restart it every, or reset it every two hours. If you are, want to learn more about how to do things with Ignition, of course, we have a great online university, and it has over 600 videos on every part of Ignition, 
And uh, there's 21 courses, and again, it's completely for free, and you can learn at your own pace uh, on your own time, and it's also searchable, so you can really get the answers uh, quickly to your questions. With that, uh, let's move into the Q&A. As you see on here on screen, there are some contact informations for um, myself as well as some account executives. Um, and um, uh, uh, we didn't put Arlen's up here, but of course, uh, Arlen, we can provide um, you know content information for for SiriusLink as well. There's information on our website about that. But if you guys need demonstrations or any have any follow-up technical discussions you want, please feel free to reach out to any of uh, to any of these people here. Uh, with that, let's move into the Q and A. We have we have a few questions, quite a few questions here to get through. Again, if we don't get to all of them, we'll um, we'll definitely come back around after the webinar and get in touch with you guys. So, first and foremost, is uh, S3 Data Lake more suited to fog computing and manufacturing environments? Um, so I can start with that, and then Arlen, you may have uh, uh, you know something to say on that point. Um, so S3 Data Lake, I mean, it's a low, it's a lower cost storage of the data that you have, and you can store any kind of data you want in S3. Um, and so that does allow, you know, for having fog computing, for being able to say, for example, you know, take that data and, and work with it locally, um, and you know, to to make decisions there locally. But working with the cloud in conjunction, a lot of machine learning systems have that ability where the models are up in the cloud. But then we, once the models are done, we can download those models too. Uh, device and have that real-time uh, predictive ha analytics happening locally. Um, Arlen, anything to share on that topic? I, I would agree. I mean, we have customers using S3 Data Lake. We also have customers. I didn't demo the uh, DynamoDB, but to Travis's point, uh, if you're just looking at taking lots and lots of unstructured data, you don't know how it's all going to be organized, but you want to throw it into a NoSQL database that you can operate on later, then DynamoDB is another alternative to that. Perfect. This question is going to be for you, Arlen. Um, the, you, did, you talked about the predictive OE solution, and uh, Huck is wondering if there's a white paper or more information about this solution, as it would be a great use case um, for, one of, uh, for one of their customers. Uh, there's not a there's not a white paper yet. We are working on that. But uh, again, I would say, just say contact us. What we are finding out is a lot of our MQTT modules are going out for MES solutions because it to the point of if you're using MQTT, you're probably saving eighty to ninety percent of your bandwidth. Uh, Ten years ago, that meant savings in comms. But in 2017, that means that 70 to 80% more data you can put on the same network. We're seeing the, a lot of these OEE and MES systems consume very large amounts of data and then wanting to shoot that to all sorts of different applications. And that's why MQTT is such a perfect infrastructure for that. All right. So there's a question here from Kenneth. I think I already submitted uh, the registration, but does the AWS injector and or Azure injector run on Ignition Edge? I see the presentation um, talks about the injectors, uh, and uh, but I'm not quite sure. I want to know what the cost is. So absolutely, Kenneth, the, the, those injectors do work on Ignition Edge. The, for Edge, the products are $200 um, each uh, for the Edge, um, since Edge is a lower cost version of Ignition with that restriction of 500 tags. You most certainly can run those on there. Um, there's a question here from Anthony about what happens if AWS shuts down or starts charging out of control prices. Um, so Arlen, you may want to, uh, to comment on that. I've got a couple things I can say as well. Okay. Well, first of all, you're right. You're responsible for deploying and managing your AWS instances, but you can set limits. That's why they had this whole cloud watch service in that if you're all of a sudden your insert rates on Kinesis went from, you know, five tags a second to 500 tags a second, you would probably get all sorts of alerts from your cloud watch about the fact that you're exceeding your capacity. Yeah, and so uh, from, a, from a different perspective as far as, you know, if you want to move away from AWS, I mean, that's why at Ignition we want to supply connecting connectivity and injecting to multiple different platforms so you have a lot more options out there. You can easily move around if you wanted to from one to the other. 
Um, I will mention. I will mention, Travis, that I didn't go through this again. Each one of these subjects could be a whole hour webinar, but we do have store and forward. So let's say AWS did go down. Uh, then for uh, you know a, a certain amount of time, the tags that are being reported would be stored locally in Ignition Gateway and then reported when the service came back up. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Um, okay, so there will be a there will be a, there's a lot of questions about will its presentation be available after today? Absolutely, uh, definitely get the the uh, the, sl the slide deck here, no problem. So let's see another question here. Does IA or SiriusLink have any strategic partners that can help develop and configure on the Azure or AWS side? That's from Anthony. Arlen? Uh, yes. I mean, they're, they're, we work with a whole um, team of AWS architects that can help you if, if you're, you know, a lot of people are kind of coming from scratch at this. So Amazon has a huge number of resources available out there, both with uh, third party partners as well as AWS themselves to help you architect your uh, service topology, if you will, in the best way that you need it for your particular application. So there are a lot of resources out there on that, and they they really are both Azure, Microsoft, Google Cloud Platform, IBM Bluemix, are all very focused on operational data now. Okay, so the next question here is MQTT really uh, is MQTT related modules available in trial version? Absolutely. Uh, Depeka, the, the modules, all the MQTT and the injectors are available in the two-hour trial period, and you can definitely prove them out right now without having to buy them uh, for sure. So um, the question here is, um, does, I don't, I don't know I'm going to throw this your way, does MQTT make OPC UA obsolete? No, no. It, it, they're two different technologies. Um, you know, I, I try not to. I try not to get into that argument. Um, MQTT was. You have to remember when when I co-invented MQTT with Andy Stanford Clark twenty years ago, it was for a VSAT system for more efficient reporting of tags from very remote locations into a centralized infrastructure. Um, a lot of these use cases that we see, we can't afford to run OPC UA over limited bandwidth because it's just a lot thicker, um, uh, heavier protocol, if you will. But I, I think if you look at the use cases, there are very good use cases for OPC UA. There are very good use cases for MQTT, and I think they will continue to coexist just like they have for the last 20 years. Okay, good. Um, so a question here is, what are the advantages of using publish subscribe mechanisms over polling when working um, with MQTT? So certainly um, that M MQTT is a pub sub protocol um, and we push, uh, you know, it itself um, will publish data to a to message oriented middleware. Now when it comes to Brownfield and legacy PLCs that have their poll response protocols, We've got to convert that. Obviously, that device is not going to support MQTT natively, so we've got to have an edge device or edge gateway. It's either uh, hardware or software that's going to have the drivers necessary to talk to the PLC locally. Typically, you want that polling to be right next to each other. Push that to the edge of the network, and from there, pu push, uh, publish that data to a, a central MQTT server, whether it's on premise or in the cloud. So, um, for for the greenfield arena, there's going to be there's a lot of there's a big ecosystem of, of partners and products that um, have MQTT supported natively, in which case it's just plug and play, uh, and you'll be able to easily take advantage of that data. So um, you know, polling just doesn't make sense, right? If we have to poll the PLC um, you know, every second just to see a value change, it's a lot of unnecessary work uh, and bandwidth, whereas with publish subscribe, the, the devices or the, ed, you know, the edge will uh, push the, the data up as those values change, report by exception, and with the load bandwidth protocol, we can do that very effectively. Let's see, I think there's a lot more questions, unfortunately. Um, there, we don't have any more time here, but we will get back to those questions. I think in, in, in wrap up here, we appreciate everybody attending today. And I know we can do a lot more in regards to this particular topic. Uh, we can have many, many more webinars on that too. Um, we are certainly willing and able to, uh, to have more follow-up discussions. Um, with that being said, Arlen, do you have any last words? Uh, no, this was a very good opportunity. I, I hope that that to Travis's point, uh, each one of the, the the services 
on any of the cloud could be uh, a whole webinar in and of itself. Uh, I hope that the demo that I did just gave you a flavor for what you can do for the art of the possible. And please contact us if you need any follow-up demos or any follow-up information. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Arlen. And, uh, Arlen, and we will uh, wrap up. Have a great rest of your day.